a point of contact. A curious train of thought is started when one reflects upon those great figures who have trod the stage of this earth and actually played their parts in the same act, without ever coming face to face or even knowing of each other's existence. Baber, the great mogul, was, for example, overrunning India at the very moment when Hernando Cortes was overrunning Mexico, and yet the two could never have heard of each other. Or, to take a more supreme example, what could the Emperor Augustus Caesar know of a certain carpenter's shop wherein there worked a dreamy-eyed boy who was destined to change the whole face of the world? It may be, however, that sometimes these great contemporary forces did approach, touch, and separate, each unaware of the true meaning of the other. So it was in the instance which is now narrated. It was evening in the port of Tyre, some eleven hundred years before the coming of Christ, the city held at that time about a quarter of a million of inhabitants, the majority of whom dwelt upon the mainland, where the buildings of the wealthy merchants, each in its own tree-girt garden, extended for seven miles along the coast. The great island, however, from which the town got its name, lay out some distance from the shore, and contained within its narrow borders the more famous of the temples and public buildings. Of these temples, the chief was that of Melmoth, which covered, with its long colonnades, the greater part of that side of the island which looked down upon the Sidonian port, so called because only twenty miles away the older city of Sidon maintained a constant stream of traffic with its rising offshoot. Inns were not yet in vogue, but the poorer traveller found his quarters with hospitable citizens, while men of distinction were frequently housed in the annex of the temples, where the servants of the priests attended to their wants. On that particular evening there stood in the portico of the temple of Melmoth two remarkable figures, who were the centre of observation for a considerable fringe of Phoenician idlers. One of these men was clearly, by his face and demeanour, a great chieftain. His strongly marked features were those of a man who had led an adventurous life, and were suggestive of every virile quality, from brave resolve to desperate execution. His broad, high brow and contemplative eyes showed that he was a man of wisdom as well as of valour. He was clad, as became a Greek nobleman of the period, with a pure white linen tunic, a gold-studded belt supporting a short sword, and a purple cloak. The lower legs were bare and the feet covered by sandals of red leather, while a cap of white cloth was pushed back upon his brown curls, for the heat of the day was past, and the evening breeze most welcome. His companion was a short, thick-set man, bull-necked and swarthy, clad in some dusky cloth, which gave him a sombre appearance, relieved only by the vivid scarlet of his woollen cap. His manner towards his comrade was one of deference, and yet there was in it also something of that freshness and frankness which go with common dangers and a common interest. Be not impatient, sire, he was saying. Give me two days, or three at the most, and we shall make as brave a show at the muster as any. But, indeed, they would smile if they saw us crawl up to Tenidos with ten missing oars and the mainsail blown into rags. The other frowned and stamped his foot with anger. We should have been there now had it not been for this cursed mischance, said he. Aeolus played us a pretty trick when he sent such a blast out of a cloudless sky. Well, sire, two of the Cretan galleys foundered. 
and Trophimes, the pilot, swears that one of the Argus ships was in trouble. Praise use that it was not the galley of Menelaus. We shall not be the last at the muster. It is well that Troy stands a good ten miles from the sea, for if they came out at us with a fleet they might have us at a disadvantage. We had no choice but to come here and refit. Yet I shall have no happy hour until I see the white foam from the lash of our oars once more. Go, Seleucus, and speed them all you may. The officer bowed and departed, while the chieftain stood with his eyes fixed upon his great dismantled galley, over which the riggers and carpenters were swarming. Further out in the roadstead lay eleven other smaller galleys, waiting until their wounded flagship should be ready for them. The sun, as it shone upon them, gleamed upon hundreds of bronze helmets and breastplates, telling of the warlike nature of the errand upon which they were engaged. Save for them, the port was filled with bustling merchant ships, taking in cargoes or disgorging them upon the quays. At the very feet of the Greek chieftain three broad barges were moored, and gangs of labourers with wooden shovels were heaving out the mussels bought from door, destined to supply the famous Tyrian dye-works, which adorn the most noble of all garments. Beside them was a tin ship from Britain, and the square boxes of that precious metal, so needful for the making of bronze, were being passed from hand to hand to the waiting wagons. The Greek found himself smiling at the uncouth wonder of a Cornishman who had come with his tin, and who was now lost in amazement as he stared at the long colonnades of the Temple of Melmoth and the high front of the shrine of Ashtaroth behind it. Even as he gazed, some of his shipmates passed their hands through his arms and led him along the quay to a wine shop, as being a building much more within his comprehension. The Greek, still smiling, was turning on his heels to return to the temple when one of the clean-shaven priests of Baal came towards him. It is rumoured, sire, said he, that you are on a very distant and dangerous venture. Indeed, it is well known from the talk of your soldiers what it is that you have on hand. It is true, said the Greek, that we have a hard task before us. But it would have been harder to bide at home, and to feel that the honour of a leader of the Argives had been soiled by this dog from Asia. I hear that all Greece has taken up the quarrel. Yes, there is not a chief from Thessaly to the Malia who has not called out his men, and there were twelve hundred galleys in the harbour of Aulis. It is a great host, said the priest, but have ye any seers or prophets among ye who can tell what will come to pass? Yes, we had one such, Calchas his name. He has said that for nine years we shall strive, and only on the tenth will the victory come. That is but cold comfort, said the priest. It is indeed a great prize which can be worth ten years of a man's life. I would give, the Greek answered, not ten years, but all my life, if I could but lay proud Ilium in ashes, and carry back Helen to her palace on the hill of Argus. I pray, Baal, whose priest I am, that you may have good fortune, said the Phoenician. I have heard that these Trojans are stout soldiers, and that Hector, the son of Priam, is a mighty leader. The Greek smiled proudly. They must be stout and well fed also, said he, if they can stand the brunt against the long-haired Argives, with such captains of Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, from golden Mycenae, or Achilles, son of Peleus, with his Myrmidons. But these things are on the knees of the fates. In the meantime, my friend, I would fain know who these strange people are who come down the street, for their chieftain has the air of one who is made for great deeds. A tall man clad in a long white robe, with a golden fillet running through his flowing auburn hair, 
was striding down the street with the free, elastic gait of one who has lived an active life in the open. His face was ruddy and noble, with a short, crisp beard covering a strong, square jaw. In his clear blue eyes, as he looked at the evening sky and the busy waters beneath him, there was something of the exaltation of the poet, while a youth walking beside him and carrying a harp hinted at the graces of music. On the other side of him, however, a second squire bore a brazen shield and a heavy spear, so that his master might never be caught unawares by his enemies. In his train there came a tumultuous rabble of dark, hawk-like men, armed to the teeth, and peering about with covetous eyes at the signs of wealth which lay in profusion around them. They were swarthy as Arabs, and yet they were better clad and better armed than the wild children of the desert. They are but barbarians, said the priest. He is a small king from the mountain parts opposite Philistia, and he comes here because he is building up the town of Chebus, which he means to be his chief city. It is only here that he can find the wood and stone and craftsmanship that he desires. The youth with the harp is his son. But I pray you, chief, if you would know what is before you at Troy, to come now into the outer hall of the temple with me, for we have there a famous seer, the prophetess Alaga, who is also the priestess of Ashtaroth. It may be that she can do for you what she has done for many others, and send you forth from Tyre in your hollow ships with a better heart than you came. To the Greeks, who by oracles, omens, and auguries were forever prying into the future, such a suggestion was always welcome. The Greek followed the priest to the inner sanctuary, where sat the famous Pythoness, a tall fair woman of middle age, who sat at a stone table upon which was an abacus or tray filled with sand. She held a style of chalcedony, and with this she traced strange lines and curves upon the smooth surface, her chin leaning upon her other hand and her eyes cast down. As the chief and the priest approached her, she did not look up, but she quickened the movements of her pencil, so that curve followed curve in quick succession. Then, still with downcast eyes, she spoke in a strange, high, sighing voice, like wind among the trees. Who then is this who comes to Alaga of Tyre, the handmaiden of great Ashtaroth? Behold, I see an island to the west, and an old man who is the father, and the great chief, and his wife, and his son, who now waits him at home, being too young for the wars. Is this not true? Yes, maiden, you have said the truth, the Greek answered. I have had many great ones before me, but none greater than you. For three thousand years from now, people will still talk of your bravery and of your wisdom. They will remember also the faithful wife at home, and the name of the old man, your father, and of the boy, your son. All will be remembered when the very stones of noble Sidon and royal Tyre are no more. Nay, say not so, Alaga, cried the priest. I speak not what I desire but what it is given to me to say. For ten years you will strive, and then you will win, and victory will bring rest to others. But only new troubles to you. Ah! The prophetess suddenly started in violent surprise, and her hand made ever faster markings on the sand. What is it that ails you, Alaga? asked the priest. The woman had looked up with wild, inquiring eyes, her gaze was neither for the priest nor for the chief, but shot past them to the further door. Looking round, the Greek was aware that two new figures had entered the room. They were the ruddy barbarian 
whom he had marked in the street, together with the youth who bore his harp. It is a marvel upon marvels that two such should enter my chamber on the same day, cried the priestess. Have I not said that you were the greatest that ever came? And yet, behold, here is already one who is greater, for he and his son, even this youth whom I see before me, will also be in the minds of all men, when lands beyond the pillars of Hercules shall have taken the place of Phoenicia and of Greece. Hail to you, stranger, hail! Pass on to your work, for it awaits you. And it is great beyond words of mine. Rising from her stool, the woman dropped her pencil upon the sand and passed swiftly from the room. It is over, said the priest. Never have I heard her speak such words. The Greek chief looked with interest at the barbarian. You speak Greek, he asked. Indifferently well, said the other. Yet I should understand it, seeing that I spent a long year at Ziklag, in the land of the Philistines. It would seem, said the Greek, that the gods have chosen us both to play a part in the world. Stranger, the barbarian answered, there is but one god. Say you so. Well, it is a matter to be argued at some better time, but I would fain have your name and style, and what it is you purpose to do, so that we may perchance hear of each other in the years to come. For my part I am Odysseus, known also as Ulysses, the king of Ithaca, with the good Laertes as my father, and young Telemachus as my son. For my work it is the taking of Troy, and my work, said the barbarian, is the building of Jabus, which now we call Jerusalem. Our ways lie separate. But it may come back to your memory that you have crossed the path of David, second king of the Hebrews, together with his young son Solomon, who may follow him upon the throne of Israel. So he turned and went forth into the darkened streets, where his spearmen were awaiting him, while the Greek passed down to his boat, that he might see what was still to be done, ere he could set forth upon his voyage. That is the end of A Point of Contact by Arthur Conan Doyle Read by Greg Wagland For Magpie Audio 2021 Thank you for listening and please subscribe.